Statistical Inference. This module reviews several concepts relating to statistical inference. You should already be familiar with the concepts we are going to discuss. Estimators and their probability distribution function and estimates, which are single points on the real line. We will also review the concepts of statistical significance and p-values. Another objective of this module is to familiarise yourself with how to interpret the results of an impact evaluation. There are a number of representative evaluations that anyone doing impact evaluation should know. The Mexican cash transfer programme Progresa, later named Oportunidades or Prospera, is one such programme. Take the time to read at least one of the many research articles based on the programme's experimental evaluation and familiarise yourself with the basics. Progressa is one of the best-known developing country RCTs. The evaluators have information on eligible households from both before and after its implementation. Baseline data refers to information collected before the programme started. Follow-up data refers to information collected after the programme was implemented. Only follow-up data is mandatory when conducting an RCT. However, Baseline data can really help to assess the impact of a programme. The paper about Progressa, which is available on the course webpage, analyses data from 560 programme eligible communities that participated in the programme evaluation. This is the experimental sample. What is interesting about this programme is that 186 communities were randomly selected to receive the programme much later than the rest of the eligible communities. The Progressor database became the subject of multiple evaluation studies that use this random selection of communities. There is a treatment group of households from 374 eligible communities and a control group which consists of households in 186 eligible but untreated communities. As in Progressor, when evaluating a programme, we want to estimate the causal effect of a treatment on an experimental sample drawn from the population of interest. Using random assignment, the probability of being assigned to the treatment group is identical for all agents. Therefore, treatment status D is statistically independent of the subject's potential outcomes. Furthermore, the assignment D is independent of the agent's background attributes X. Geometrically, potential outcome YT, potential outcome YC and background attributes X are orthogonal to the assignment either to the treatment group D equals 1 or control group D equals 0. For example, if you roll a die to assign units to treatment with a 1 6 probability, knowing whether a subject is treated provides no information about the subject's potential outcomes or background attributes. This gives us statistical independence. When we have statistical independence, the expected treatment outcome YT of an agent assigned to the treatment group is equal to the expected treatment outcome of any agent in the experimental group, regardless of its assignment, because the assignment is random. You can see that the right-hand side of the equation has no conditioning, no vertical bar. When we randomly select agents to the treatment group D equals 1, the agents left behind are also a random sample of the experimental sample. The expected treatment outcome, given that an agent has been assigned to the control group D equals zero, is equal to the expected treatment outcome for the entire experimental sample. The challenge of estimating the average treatment effect in an evaluation sample is that at a given point in time, each agent is either treated or not, but not both at the same time. Random assignment addresses this counterfactual problem as a missing data problem by creating two groups, treatment and control. The hypothesis underlying an RCT is that assignment to the treatment or control group bears no systematic relationship to the agent's observed or unobserved attributes. The expected treatment effect is equal to the difference between expected outcomes because the expected value is a linear function. We approximate these expected values using their sample averages. When the treatment is assigned randomly, we do not observe the two potential outcomes for all units but we can estimate or approximate the average treatment effect from the difference between the two sample means. In the last module, we also introduced the concept of identification strategy. The identification strategy refers to the set of tools or methods that enable us to use observable quantities to measure the causal effects of a treatment. 
In an RCT, the identification strategy is the random assignment to treatment and control because it allows us to use observed average outcomes to measure causal effects. The statistical procedure, the formula, used to obtain a measure of these causal effects is called an estimator. Last module, we saw a very simple estimator of the average treatment effect, which was just the difference between the two sample averages in the follow-up data. Again, an estimator is a mathematical formula that generates guesses about parameters such as the average treatment effect. The number generated by an estimator, the guess based on a particular experimental sample, is called an estimate. Unfortunately, estimators and estimates are both denoted using a hat. For instance, if the true treatment effect of a program is called beta, its estimate will be written beta hat. The estimates are single points, numbers on the real line, whereas the estimators are random variables. These are very different objects. Having a point estimate means that evaluations are inherently limited in the kind of conclusions you can draw from them. An evaluation gives you a single point estimate of the program or policy impact. Just one estimate, that isn't much. Another issue is that you don't know how far apart your estimate beta hat is from the true causal effect beta. The good news is that the distribution of the estimator gives us a general idea of the precision and accuracy of the single estimate that we observe. This image shows the output on the real line. I set zero as the benchmark. Assume for a moment that the real mean effect of a program, denoted by beta, is to the right of zero. It is a positive effect. My estimate of this mean effect is a single point, beta hat. My estimate can be to the left, or to the right of the true mean treatment effect. I have no idea where my beta hat is in relation to the true mean effect beta that I cannot observe. I can only observe beta hat. Luckily, statistical theory tells us that the estimators, the formulas we use to calculate beta hat, are random variables, which means they have a distribution of probabilities. Our estimator of the treatment effect, the difference of means, has the excellent statistical property of being centered on the true mean effect beta. But be aware that we do not observe this estimator's distribution, and nor do we see the true treatment effect. However, we know that the ATE estimator of an RCT is unbiased. Unbiased means that the distribution of the estimator is centered on the true treatment effect beta. Up to now, we have seen that estimators are random variables with distributions of probabilities. On the horizontal axis are the values that the estimator can take. On the vertical axis is the probability of observing each value. The larger the probability, the more likely an event is. In this example, there is a non-zero probability of obtaining this point estimate, or an even higher value when using the estimator beta hat. This probability is given by the area under the curve, to the right-hand tail of the distribution. Of course, there is a higher probability that the estimate is near the true mean treatment effect beta. However, you cannot know where exactly your point estimate is with respect to this distribution. Well, possibly if you repeat an impact evaluation several times, and I mean you do the whole process from the beginning, including selecting an experimental sample, treatment group and control group, and then estimating the program impact, if you repeat it a thousand times, you will obtain a thousand beta hats, a thousand estimates, and maybe then you would be able to observe the distribution of the estimator. In standard evaluations, however, you have one single point from this entire distribution. So if your estimator is unbiased, like the ATE in an RCT, you can be sure of a high probability that your single point estimate is near the true treatment effect because the distribution of the ATE is centered on the true beta. An estimator is unbiased if its mean is equal to the true parameter. If the expected value of the ATE is the true treatment effect, then the ATE is unbiased. Although bias is a property of estimators and not estimates, we often refer to the estimate generated by an unbiased estimator as an unbiased estimate. When analysing empirical evidence, the aim is not only to use unbiased estimators to obtain an exact measure of a treatment impact, we also want precision in our results. Precision is the reciprocal of the variance. If an estimator has a large variance, it means that it is very imprecise. 
there is a great deal of uncertainty about how close we are to the true treatment effect. In this figure, the probability of obtaining an estimate far from the true treatment effect is relatively small. In a distribution with a larger variance, there is quite a high probability that your estimate is far from the true value. Yes, the distribution is centred on the mean treatment effect and it is unbiased, but the variance is so large that it is not likely your estimate will be near to the true beta. To summarise, we want unbiased estimators with little variance, or precise estimators. If your estimator is unbiased and has the smallest possible variance, you can be quite confident that your single point estimate is around the true value. If your estimator has a large variance, you are imprecise. The standard error measures the precision of a point estimate. The larger the standard error, the more uncertain the estimator distribution. When we use an estimator to approximate a treatment impact, we use its formula to obtain one value, a single point estimate of the treatment effect, and a standard error, which we will not discuss here, but let's just say we know its value. Then we ask the question, how likely is it that my estimate comes from an estimated distribution that is centred on zero. In other words, is the true treatment effect zero? If this is the case, the figure on the screen represents the distribution of the estimator. A point estimate is never exactly zero. There are at least two potential reasons for this. First, natural variations of the estimator around the true value. Second, maybe I'm wrong and the true treatment impact is not zero. We are not really interested in the one-point estimate that we just observed. We know it is not the true value of the parameter. What we really want to know is, given this one point that we can observe from the distribution, should we conclude that the true parameter beta that we do not observe is zero? Once again, let's discuss the systematic procedure we use to answer our question. Using our one single point that we observe, is the true treatment effect zero? We only have two pieces of information available, one beta hat and one standard error. This is all we can observe. Let's suppose that the true treatment effect is zero. In this case, our estimator will distribute around zero when we are using an unbiased estimator, while the standard error gives us an idea of the spread of my distribution. If I get a small standard error, I should have a very narrow distribution around the true value. If I have a large standard error, I should have a widespread distribution that is less precise. This is the estimated distribution I would have if the treatment effect was zero. I then compare my point estimate, my observed beta hat, with this hypothetical distribution. Suppose I obtained a beta hat equal to the number four. It is clearly very unlikely that this beta hat came from a distribution centered on zero. If this is the true distribution, I should have obtained some value around zero, not four. In this first example, I conclude that the distribution centered on zero is the wrong distribution. My assumption about the treatment effect being zero was probably wrong. If the true treatment effect is zero, then it is very unlikely I would obtain a beta hat so far away as four. Now suppose your beta hat is minus six. This is an even worse situation. If the true treatment effect was zero and the distribution of my estimator is the one in the graphic, there is basically no way I could randomly draw a minus six value from this distribution. This distribution must be the wrong one. The true distribution is not centered around zero. In the second example, I reject the null hypothesis of zero treatment effect. It is quite easy to decide whether your zero effect hypothesis is correct when you obtain estimates relatively distant from zero, given your estimated distribution. But what if your estimate is not so far away from zero? Let's say you calculate the ATE and obtain minus two. Beta hat is minus two. There is a possibility that the estimated distribution is centered around zero and that you randomly drew a single value of minus two from that distribution. However, the probability is still low. In this example, I conclude it is improbable that minus two came from this distribution. The distribution centered on zero must not be the right distribution. Therefore, the true distribution must not be centered on zero. What if I obtain 1.9? The choice becomes even less straightforward. 
it is quite probable that if I draw a number from this distribution, I obtain 1.9. There is not a very high probability, but it is possible. I wouldn't know what to decide in this case. I don't really know if this is the true estimated distribution or not, so I cannot reject the null hypothesis in this final example. So we are faced with the question, where's the limit? At what point can we say this could be the right estimated distribution? Or it definitely is not. Is there any consensus? The standard approach is to take the area under your estimated distribution as 100%. Then cut the tails, leaving 95% of the distribution between the cutoffs. This means there is 2.5% of the total area on the left side of the cutoff and 2.5% of the total area to the right of the cut point. Whenever beta hat is beyond these two cut points, you can say, no, this is not the right distribution. Therefore, my beta hat does not come from a distribution centered on zero. If your beta hat is inside those cutting points, you should not reject the null hypothesis. Your beta hat might come from that distribution. This is nonetheless an arbitrary decision rule. Why 95%? Why not 99%? We could cut a little more. Or why not 90%? And then the cut points are even closer. There is no hard and fast answer to these questions. The cutoff is your decision. How do we determine the cut points? There are several ways. You can find them in statistic distribution tables or by using stated commands to give you the exact numbers. Instead of choosing an arbitrary rule, a standard approach consists of signalling the relative position of the beta hat with the stars. If your beta hat is within the 90% cut point, you add no stars to your estimate. If it is between 90 and 95%, you add one star. If your beta hat falls between the 95 and 99% cut points, you add two stars. And finally, if your beta hat is beyond the 99% cutoff point, you add three stars. The stars annotation is widely used in scientific literature to indicate the statistical significance of an estimate. There is another indicator that is also used to evaluate whether beta hat comes from a hypothetical distribution centered on zero. It is called the p-value. The procedure is as follows. First, you place the beta hat calculated on the real line. Let's suppose that beta hat is minus 1.65. Second, write the mirror of your beta hat, i.e. with the opposite sign, so plus 1.65, and then calculate the area under the curve that is beyond these two points. This is the probability of obtaining an estimate at least as large as the absolute value of your observed beta hat. If the p-value of this test was 9%, there would be a 9% chance of obtaining an estimate equal or smaller than minus 1.65, or equal or larger than 1.65. So, a 4.5% probability on each side of the distribution. It is conventional to dub p-values that are below 0.05 as statistically significant, meaning that under the null hypothesis, the researcher has a less than 1 in 20 probability of obtaining the observed result by chance. The 0.05 standard is a matter of convention, not statistical theory, but it is so deeply entrenched that researchers should be prepared to indicate whether their experimental results are significant at the 0.05% level. The correct way to think about an estimation result that is substantively significant, i.e. a large number, but statistically insignificant, is that it warrants further investigation. By conducting further experiments with larger sample sizes, our uncertainty about its true value will diminish. Conversely, don't be overly impressed with statistically significant results without reflecting on their substantive significance. Standard error declines with the sample size. Anything is significant with a large enough sample. The true question is how big the effect is. Impact evaluation offers guidance to policymakers about the average effect of an intervention. Policymakers typically want to know how big the average treatment effect is, 
not whether the effect is statistically distinguishable from zero. Their principal objective is to use the results to approximate the true value of the ATE. Interval estimation is a statistical procedure that uses data to generate a probability statement about the range of values within which the true parameter value is located. Conventionally, social scientists construct 95% confidence intervals, which require some guesswork. I will not go into the details of how to calculate confidence intervals, but you need to be able to interpret them from a standard output, for example in its data. In practice, we do not conduct statistical inference directly on the estimate of the treatment effect beta hat, but on a transformation of this estimate that we call the test statistic. Let's take a look at Table 2 on page 174 of the Progressor article that you have on the course website. This table presents the effects of receiving the cash transfer on agricultural and micro-enterprise activities. The first estimate on the left-hand side of the table is the estimated effect of the conditional cash transfer on animal ownership. The first column in particular tells us about the number of draft animals, or working animals, such as horses and donkeys. Households in the control group own on average 0.25 draft animals. This interpretation may seem strange as usually you either own an entire animal or you don't. It is rare to own 0.25 of an animal. You should read this as there is a 25% probability that a household in the control group owns a draft animal. The treatment coefficient is positive and statistically significant. This means that households that receive the cash transfer own more animals than those who did not and that difference is measured precisely. I know this because there are three stars next to the coefficient. One way to interpret the effect is to say treatment households are 17.1% more likely to own a draft animal. The 17% comes from the fact that the coefficient 0.042 is 17% of 0.25 in the control group. This journal, the American Economic Journal, asks researchers to publish their programming codes and datasets. I downloaded the DO file and changed a couple of lines so that I could execute their code on my computer. I can easily find the regression that corresponds with this result. Don't worry, you don't need to understand the code, just let me show you the regression results in Stata. When I execute the code, I see the estimated treatment impact again. Next to the point estimate and standard error, Stata gives you the value of the t-statistic. The t-statistic is a transformation of the estimate that takes into account the standard error. To the right, the exact p-value is 0.004, which means there is a 0.4% probability of randomly obtaining this t-statistic when the true treatment effect is zero. At less than 1%, this is a very small probability. Stata shows you the confidence interval. With 95% probability, the true treatment effect lies between 0.013 and 0.07. The true treatment effect is likely to be between these two numbers. In other words, the Progressor Cash Transfer Program increases the probability of owning a draft animal from 0.05% to 28% with 95% certainty. Conclusions. In this module, we discuss some of the concepts used to interpret the results of an impact evaluation. An impact evaluation produces estimates that can be used to test whether the average treatment effect of a program is different from zero. The standard error of an estimate is a measure of the statistical uncertainty of the estimate in a given sample. In the following modules, we will use statistical inference to analyze the results of non-experimental impact evaluations. <laughs>